September the 11th, 2001, was a day of horror for New York City and beyond. When four planes were hijacked from airports around the United States and used as weapons against the people of America, it not only resulted in the immediate death of nearly 3,000 people, it united yet also changed people's view on the world. It started a war on terror that cost the lives of thousands, and it opened up a conspiracy case that is still very much alive all these years later. But theories aside, the reality of what the people involved experienced that day, whether you think it was an inside job or not, was real. What happened to the innocent people that morning, and the mental and physical scars they sustained, cannot even be comprehended. Many of the stories from people involved have been forgotten, some will never be known, but those that are known, and those who went above and beyond to save others, deserve to be shared. For many of the families and friends, they find comfort in sharing the heroic actions of their loved ones. For others, this is not the case, they wish to quietly remember, and you will not find their stories in this video. Rest in peace all those who lost their lives that day, and the horror the people affected had to endure in the aftermath of 9-11. Wells Crowther On the morning of 9-11, 24-year-old equities trader Wells Crowther had just arrived for work and settled into his office on the 104th floor of the South Tower. At 9.03 a.m., not long after the first plane had hit the North Tower, United Airlines Flight 175 struck his tower. At 9.12 a.m., Wells called his mother and left a message on her answer phone. Mum, this is Wells. I wanted you to know that I'm okay. After this, Wells's volunteer firefighting at Boston kicked in and he then made his way down the stairs, picking up a young woman en route and carrying her over his shoulder. When he reached the 17th floor, he met a group of terrified people huddled together, waiting for help. One of those was Ling Young, who had been badly burned. Wells quickly directed the group to the stairway. He then followed them down 17 floors, where he dropped off the woman he was carrying and headed back up to the stairs to help others. He was later seen back on the 78th floor, with a red bandana wrapped around his nose and mouth to protect him from the smoke. At a young age, his father gave him a bandana, and it had become synonymous with Wells. There he escorted another group out, that included badly injured Judy Wayne, who had a broken arm, cracked rib, and a punctured lung, and was aided by Wells to safety, and made it out of the building. She later told how he administered first aid and urged everyone to help each other, but instead of heading out, Wells turned around and went back in. Witnesses say he did this several times and was last seen assisting members of the FDNY just before the South Tower collapsed at 9.59am. This selfless act of heroism cost Wells his life, but not his honour, and he will forever be remembered as the man in the red bandana. For many months, the lives Wells had saved were unaware of his whereabouts. His family also did not know how he had spent his last moments in the tower. Then they read in the New York Times an account by survivor Judy Wayne, who described how she was saved by a man in a red bandana. The family immediately recognised it was Wells, and after meeting with the people he saved, and showing them photographs, they all confirmed it was him. It's thought Wells saved as many as 18 people that day, something that brings peace to his family, knowing that he was so courageous right until the end. Wells' body was found alongside firefighters on March the 19th, 2002, and he was posthumously named as an honorary New York City firefighter. Rick Rescola Rick Rescola, born in Cornwall in the UK, went on to enlist in the British Army and then the US Army, being deployed to Vietnam. After his military career ended, he joined Dean Witter Reynolds in corporate security at their offices at the World Trade Center in New York, and went on to be director of security for financial services firm Morgan Stanley. For many years, Rescola had been concerned about security at the World Trade Centers, and anticipated that there would be attack on the towers. His worries resulted in him implementing evacuation procedures that he made staff practice. Well, on the morning of the attacks, Rescola was on the 44th floor of the South Tower, and when the North Tower was struck, he ignored the advice that came over the PA system, urging everyone to stay at their desks. 
and ordered all Morgan Stanley employees to evacuate immediately. This included the 1,000 employees in World Trade Center 5. As he calmly directed people down the stairwell, the second plane hit, rocking the building violently and sending people into a panic. To distract them from the unfolding disaster and calm the evacuees, Rescola started singing Cornish songs from his childhood, including the Welsh song, Men of Harlech, with the words changed to Men of Cornwall. Rescola even managed to call his wife, telling her he needed to get people out safely. During that morning, he successfully evacuated most of Morgan Stanley's 2,687 employees. But instead of saving himself, he went back into the building to try and evacuate everyone else. Rescola was last seen heading upwards on the 10th floor, shortly before the tower collapsed. And the people he saved will never forget the length he went to, to keep people calm and significantly reduce the loss of life that day. The Amazing People of Gander When terrorists decided to wage war on the US with the horrific 9-11 attacks, it wasn't just those directly involved in the atrocities that were affected. The impact was felt by everyone around the world, not least those that were actually traveling in planes in American airspace at the time the towers were hit. But many people overlook the actions taken by the aviation authorities and how one town in Canada showed extraordinary generosity and compassion in the face of such unprecedented events. When it was realized America was under attack, all airborne planes in and around the area were sent a message. All airways over the continental United States are closed to commercial air traffic. Land ASAP at the nearest airport. Advise your destination. 53 of these planes opted for the detour to Gander Airport in Canada, 27 of which were US commercial aircraft. After the planes landed, passengers and crew were fully informed of the situation and had to remain inside the aircraft for several hours before getting clearance to disembark. There were around 10,500 passengers and all would be descending on the town of Gander. But the people of Gander were incredible. They called their unexpected guests the plain people and the whole town came together to offer hospitality and reassurance to the terrified passengers. They converted facilities such as schools, community centers and hostels into mass lodgings for the stranded passengers. Some were taken into local homes and even women-only facilities were set up to help reduce stress. All the guests were looked after by students from the local schools and the community pulled together to cater for their every needs. During their two-day stay, they were taken on excursions and offered superb food that was prepared by restaurants and residents for free. Even laundry facilities were made available as the passengers' luggage was still on the planes. When the airports were reopened and the passengers were allowed back on the planes, every passenger was transported back to Gander Airport and not a single passenger was missing or late. Everything was superbly coordinated to make sure it was as less stressful as possible. Once on board, the passengers shared stories of their stay and bonded with each other, exchanging phone numbers and email addresses so they could stay in contact. This act of kindness by the little town in Canada to over 10,000 strangers just proves there are a lot of good people in this world and in the face of adversity, they always rise to the top. Penny and Sasville. 25-year-old Heather Penny was a first lieutenant serving as a training officer with the 121st Fighter Squadron of the District of Columbia Air National Guard. She was based at Andrews Air Base, just outside Washington. And on the morning of 9-11, news started to filter through of a plane hitting the World Trade Center. This was soon followed by a second plane and another into the Pentagon. But there was also reports that a fourth aircraft had been hijacked and was still in the air, possibly heading towards Washington. Penny and her wingman, Colonel Mark Sasville, scrambled their F-16s and took off to try and intercept the hijacked aircraft. Their mission was to find it and take it down. However, since the F-16s were not armed, it was agreed Sasville would ram the cockpit and Penny the tail, almost guaranteeing they would go down with the airliner as there would be little time to eject. The pair headed northwest into Pennsylvania in search of United Flight 93 and were completely focused and committed to the mission. After flying for some time, they learned that United Flight 93 had been taken down by a courageous group of passengers. 
What's remarkable about these two is the sacrifice they were prepared to make to avert an even bigger loss of life if the plane had flown into its intended target. Believed to have been either the White House, Camp Davis, or possibly a nuclear power plant. When interviewed after the events, Penny said the real heroes were the passengers on Flight 93 because they were willing to sacrifice themselves for the greater good of others. But so were Penny and Sasville, and they should not be forgotten about. Moira Smith NYPD officer Moira Smith was the very first officer to report the September the 11th terrorist attacks when she saw the first plane hit the North Tower. 38-year-old Smith, who had served in the police for 13 years, immediately ran into the tower and began assisting in the evacuation. Shortly after this photograph was taken of Moira helping an injured man, she ran back inside the South Tower and survivors remember her standing in front of a window that overlooked the body-strewn plaza to shield the site from the terrified evacuees and was heard saying, don't look, keep moving, over and over in a calm and steady voice. Officer Smith was last seen heading back in the South Tower to help evacuate more people. And in the immediate aftermath of the collapse of the tower, a brief radio transmission from a female officer calling for help was recorded. This channel is no place to share people's last words, but the audio has been made public. Officer Smith's remains were recovered in March 2002, and her shield and 13 collar brass are presented in the 9-11 Museum in New York City. She was survived by her husband and daughter. Smith was credited with saving hundreds of lives before Tower 2 fell, taking her life, and was the only female NYPD officer to die at the scene. Although many more have died in the aftermath of the attack, mainly due to illnesses caused by inhaling toxic air in and around Ground Zero. She was posthumously awarded the NYPD Medal of Honor and was listed among Glamour and Miss Magazine's Woman of the Year for 2001. Although when Caitlyn Jenner was awarded the same award in 2015, Smith's husband returned the award, stating, at a time when we have women in the armed forces fighting and dying for our country, heroic doctors fighting deadly diseases, women police and firefighters putting their lives on the line for total strangers, brave women overcoming life-threatening diseases, the list of possibilities goes on, is this the best you could do? Smith died saving lives and showing unbelievable courage. And when she ran back into the building to save many more lives, she sacrificed her own to give many others the chance to live. I cannot think of a more heroic action. Thank you.